Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number two. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one. Okay, so we're looking at frontal and lateral views of the chest, and one thing you notice is that the left hemidiaphragm is elevated, which suggests that there's left hemithoracic volume loss. Also, there's haziness where the left upper lobe should be, and we see this crescent of air adjacent to the aortic knob here, and that indicates left upper lobe atelectasis with the Luftsickel sign. You can also see the collapsed left upper lobe on the lateral view displaced anteriorly which is a great place to look for left upper lobe atelectasis. So Luftsickel is a German term meaning air sickle or air crescent. And it can be a helpful clue that you're dealing with left upper lobe atelectasis when you only have a frontal view. If we look at the patient's CT scan, you can again see that collapsed left upper lobe. It's completely collapsed, and that was due to an obstructing mass here at the left upper lobe bronchus, which was squamous cell carcinoma. And these left-hand images show that this air crescent sign is formed by a hyperaerated portion of the superior segment of the left lower lobe in between the collapsed lung and the aortic knob here. All right, case two, slide one of two, CT chest. Slide two of two, PET CT. So CT chest of the left upper lobe with lung windows shows extensive interlobular septal thickening. So all these septal lines here are surrounding the secondary pulmonary lobule. So normally you don't see the secondary pulmonary lobule on chest CT unless it's abnormal. So whenever you see these polygonal shapes, you should start wondering, is there interlobular septal thickening? Because at the periphery of the lobule is where you'll find the lymphatics in the pulmonary veins. And then in the center of the lobule is where the bronchioles and pulmonary arteries live. So what can cause this? Well, a mnemonic you can use is least Lisa. L is lymphangitic carcinomatosis, which can cause smooth or nodular interlobular septal thickening. Interstitial pulmonary edema, which tends to cause smooth thickening. Sarcoidosis, which tends to be nodular. And then alveolar proteinosis, which is usually smooth thickening. So this is a little nodular, the thickening we're seeing on this case. And also what's unique is that this is isolated to the left upper lobe, which would be very unusual for interstitial edema. So if we look at the patient's PET scan, you can see that that region in the left upper lobe is markedly FDG avid, which confirms lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Also, there's bilateral metastatic mediastinal and left hilar lymphadenopathy demonstrating increased FTG avidity. So this was lymphangitic spread of carcinoma due to adenocarcinoma of the lung. All right, case three, chest x-rays two weeks apart, side one of two. Slide two of two, CT scan. So on this initial chest x-ray on the left here, we have this vague hazy opacity in the left mid to lower lung, and also possibly at the right lung base. On the follow-up chest x-ray only two weeks later, you can see that that has worsened. We have increased hazy opacity there, also at the right lung base. And then we have this new paramediastinal aerosis within the left upper lobe. Looking at the patient's CT scan, there's extensive hazy ground glass opacity bilaterally throughout the lungs, a bit more predominant at the lung bases here, and also with some basal airspace opacity. Remember, ground glass opacity you can see through, you can see the underlying bronchovascular structures, but with airspace disease, you cannot. And then notably, there are also these multiple air cysts scattered throughout the mid to primarily upper lungs here, and this is that large paramediastinal air cyst we were seeing on the chest x-ray. Now, this was a severely immunocompromised patient that had developed pneumocystis gervichii pneumonia. And this is a serious fungal infection that's usually only seen in immunocompromised patients, typically AIDS patients, but can also be seen in other patients with severe immunosuppression, like those getting bone marrow transplants. And it's not usually seen until the CD4 count is quite low, below 200. Now, this used to be known as pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, but it was changed to gervichii just so we could have something new to memorize. <laughs> and it usually has a typical imaging appearance, so there's often ground glass opacity. And that can have a central distribution with peripheral sparing, or it could be more of a diffuse involvement. Sometimes you can see the crazy paving pattern where you have diffuse ground glass opacity superimposed upon interlobular septal thickening, similar to what we could see in alveolar proteinosis, and we may have some of that involving the lower lobes here. In up to a third of cases, you can have cyst formation, which tends to have an upper lung predominance, and the cysts are usually a variable size, and the wall thickness is also a variable. 
And when these are subpleural, like this large pair of mediastinal cystic focus there, they can spontaneously rupture and cause pneumothoraces, which is another complication of pneumocystis pneumonia to be aware of. And then finally, you can also have patchy consolidation, airspace disease, like what we have here in the lower lobes. All right, case four, slide one of two. Slide two of two, CT scan. So on these frontal and lateral views of the chest, we're looking at a case of sarcoidosis, which is a non casey eating granuluminous disease involving multiple organ systems. And on chest x-ray, it tends to have this classic appearance where you have bilateral symmetric massive hyalurolymphadenopathy that has kind of a lumpy appearance and is sometimes known as potato nodes because they look like a big potato. And then notice too how the lymphadenopathy is slightly elevated from the heart border, which is something that allows you to differentiate this from lymphomatous lymphadenopathy, which tends to be more confluent. And if we had more pronounced paratracheal lymphadenopathy, those three together would be known as the 1, 2, 3 sign or the Garland triad. On the CT scan, we can see multiple subpleural nodules here noted bilaterally throughout the lungs, as well as nodules along the fissures, and that's consistent with a perilymphatic pattern of nodularity, as opposed to the random slash miliary or central lobular pattern of nodular distribution. Also, you can see that there are some peribronchovascular nodules here in the right lower lobe, and also left lower lobe as well. So this would be consistent with stage two sarcoid. So there are five radiographic stages of sarcoidosis. Zero is normal. One is only lymphadenopathy. Two would be lymphadenopathy and parenchymal disease. And then three is only parenchymal disease. And then four is end stage pulmonary fibrosis. All right, last case. History, non-smoker, slide one of two. Slide two of two, axial images. Okay, so you might have noticed on these coronally formatted images of the lungs that I used extreme lung windows to bring out the parenchymal abnormality here, which is mosaic attenuation, alternating areas of darkness and brightness throughout the lungs, hypoattenuating and hyperattenuating areas. Now, if we look at the axial images, we can more accurately describe that mosaic attenuation as mosaic perfusion, because in the dark areas here, the vessels are smaller in size than the vessels in the bright areas. Also notice that down here, this little vessel is smaller in the darker area compared to the adjacent vessel in the bright area of the lung. And that tells you that these dark hypoattenuating areas are abnormal. Most commonly, that's due to gas trapping. And what's happening is reflexive vasoconstriction is occurring and blood is being shunting away from these alveoli where there's no oxygen exchange going on to other areas of the lung. Less commonly, that can also be due to occlusive vascular disease like chronic thromboembolism. So if, as we look at the lungs further, you can also notice that there are these patchy areas of ground glass opacity in addition to this mosaic perfusion. And there's also areas of normal lungs. So that combination is known as the head cheese sign, which I'm sure is everybody's favorite snack. <laughs> and if you combine the head cheese sign in a patient who's not a smoker, that's typical for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And this patient had a lung biopsy that confirmed it. And interestingly, HP occurs less commonly in smokers, and it's thought that that's because the smoker's lungs are constantly exposed to toxic smoke, and HP is an inflammatory disease of the lung, secondary to an inhaled toxin like fungus, mold, chemicals, or dust. So one of the mainstays of treatment is to remove the offending agent. Also, notice that there are some scattered central lobular ground glass nodules within the upper lungs, and that's typical for subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis. All right, that's it for five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number two. If you enjoyed this lecture, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be splendid if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks and have a great day.